Good afternoon and welcome. My name is Patsy Hicks and I'm Director of Education here at the Santa Barbara Museum of Art and delighted that the Santa Ana winds and the heat have not kept you from our auditorium. Um, days like this, I was just saying to Susan, I sometimes feel a kind of a nervous excitement when those winds come. Um, it kind of changes the way you look at the world. And I think given Susan's proclivity and attachment to Southern California, it's kind of a welcoming weather, I think, for her. Um, I'm going to ask you before we start and I introduce her to just check and make sure you turned off your cell phones, if you would, so they don't distract us. And you're going to notice these images are going to be rolling through. They're not attached to any particular one comment that Susan is making, but she'll refer to them. So don't think that you're in an art history lecture where each slide is going to match one comment. Um, it's more a sense uh, of the story unfolding or unrolling behind us. So. So when you meet Susan Strait, she is likely to ask you where you are from. Or to distinguish further, she might drill down to, where are you from, from? For Susan, the answer to these questions is fundamental. Born and raised in Riverside, she still lives there with her family. When asked why she has never moved, though she could have, her answer is simply, Riverside is home. Susan teaches in UC Riverside Creative Writing Program and has made the region the subject of both her fiction and nonfiction, producing a prodigious and much praised body of published works, including seven novels, one middle grade reader, and now a memoir in the country of women, the subject of her talk this afternoon. Her 2001 novel, High Wire Moon, was a finalist for the National Book Award, other honors include a Guggenheim Fellowship and a Landman Literary Prize, and she is a recipient of the LA Times Book Prize's Robert Kirsch Award for Lifetime Achievement. Susan says she tells these Riverside stories so that the true personal histories of ordinary people can live on. In telling them, she writes of a geography she knows so well that in the particulars of place and voice, she opens up the world. In this, she is not unlike Eudora Welty, a writer she much admires. Says straight of Welty, I think how amazing it was that she chronicled her small town of Jackson, Mississippi with that kind of love, and she stayed there. And I think, well, if it's okay for her, it's all right for me. In this memoir, the stories Susan shares with her daughters and with us, her readers, Hard as they are, these stories are suffused with love. When she teaches her creative writing students at the University of California, Riverside, Susan always gives them this advice. The best thing I could say is, you do have to be a really good listener. Stories start there. Let us listen now and welcome to this stage, Susan Strait. What a beautiful introduction. That was so nice. Now, I don't have to stand here, right? I can move a little bit. But when you're as short as I am, it doesn't really matter where you stand anyway. Um, it was a lovely introduction. And, and thanks to Nick, too, for putting this together. Because the photos, to me, were little scraps of things that I found. And it was really important for this book that Douglas McCullough, a friend of mine who is a world-renowned photographer and who went to school here at UC Santa Barbara, he was able to rescue some of the little fragments that you see. And then he took the pictures that are more contemporary. Um, so there are just a lot of women. And I think the best thing for me to do, the best way for me to talk about this book, uh, because I, I was with Tina. Um, with the Emerging Teens class, and they were 
kids from 7th, 8th, 9th, 10th grades. I was at Santa Barbara City College in the lovely presence of people who were at community college. And um, I was with some interns yesterday, I mean Friday, and we talked about art. But for me, really for our audience, we're Californians, whether we started that way or whether we are now, right? And Patsy's right, the Santa Ana wind kind of plays a big part in the book. So I thought the best way to have this not be, this is not, you know, you must look at this, is to read you a couple of small pieces of this that are pretty scary. And the first one I'm going to read you is actually, um, it's, it's about my mom running me over. So are you ready for that one? All right, so if you look, if you look at my legs, um, this one is bowed, and this one is kind of really nice and straight. This is my surgically repaired leg. Uh, so I was going to be a cheerleader. I'm gonna tell you this little story about my mom. So my mom is the little girl in the Swiss parade. You see the woman who's from Switzerland, she's wearing, that's my grandmother. And my grandmother died when my mom was only nine years old. So this was in the Heidi Alps, right? How many of you know Heidi? This, yeah, my mom would not talk much about her childhood until recently. She's 85 now. She'll be 86 in December. But we read Heidi, and I would say to my mom, so was your childhood like Heidi? And she said, it was much worse than Heidi. And of course, if you remember Heidi, you're like, that was bad, <laughs> okay? <laughs> like Heidi was sent away to live with her grandfather and he didn't like her. My mom's mom died and my mom at nine saw her mother's body laid out on the kitchen table because that's how it was back then, wasn't it? If you were in a small house in the Swiss Alps. Her father, Paul Lu, and there's a wedding photo that, that you see through here, he married the younger nurse who had really helped his wife to die. And so my mom was nine. Her little brothers were, um, maybe she was even younger than that. She says she was nine, but to me she looks much younger than that. But they're all short too. They're from Switzerland. Um, she had two little brothers. So there's that wedding photo where my mom is kind of leaning away. Her dad marries this nurse named Rosa Erb. And my grandmother, the only grandmother I ever knew, was this stern, you could say joyless woman, but no, as I came to know her once I became a mom, she was the anchor for the family to leave Switzerland, then go to Oshawa, Ontario, Canada, and where my, my grandfather could not hold a job. They were sharecroppers. They worked in the cornfield, and my mom was 15, and she wasn't able to go to school. She only told this to me and my daughters, like I said, in the last five years. If I asked her before, she'd say, I don't remember. I don't remember anything. Does, has that happened to you where you ask someone something, right? And they say either it's none of your damn business, that was my dad, or I don't remember, that was my mom. So my mom, when she was 15, she's working in the fields. Her two younger brothers get to go to school. My grandma decides to marry her off to a pig farmer. You guys are like, wait, you were going to tell us about your broken leg. I am. <laughs> she ran away at 15. She was not going to marry a pig farmer in Ontario, Canada. She ran away with her small suitcase that she had carried on the boat from Switzerland. And she ran to a, she likes to say brick house, because my mom has always, as I say in here, loved the finer points of real estate. She went to live in a brick house with a family, and she was their babysitter. They had three kids. At night, she worked in a diner that served men from the Oshawa GM auto plant, which is just closing now. And so she never got to go back to high school. When she heard that her family had gone to California, she decided to go there. My grandmother, Rosa Arab, had been a nurse her whole life since she was 16. So they left Oshawa, Ontario. They went to Winter Haven, Florida. Nothing worked out, and my grandmother says, the spiders were the size of pancakes, in her Swiss accent. <laughs> she got a postcard, and how many of us know that story? You get a postcard from California, what's it gonna show? Orange, Orange trees and? Pond. Sometimes palm trees, and for Fontana, which for my grandmother was the promised land, you guys are like, what? <laughs> she would say, and then we moved to Fontana, and it would sound so beautiful. <laughs> this was a postcard that had 
you know, orange-laden trees, and in the back were snow-covered San Bernardino mountains, like Mount Baldy, all right? She got this postcard, and it said that Kaiser Steel was hiring nurses. And my grandmother brought the rest of the family in a 14-foot travel trailer, Oshawa to Winter Haven, Florida, to Fontana. They parked it in a trailer court, and they lived in that travel trailer for three years. My, my um, aunt, Steenie, who was the youngest, she was, she was Rosa's daughter, and the two boys. The reason I say this is because that's who raised my mom. She was a mean stepmother, for sure. So my mom, who's four foot 11, showed up when she was 19 years old. She'd been working all this time. She said, I'm not gonna live in a trailer and have a shared bathroom, you know, in a cement, cement building. So she rented a room in Riverside on Mission Inn Avenue, a single room, and she got a job for household finance. She was a loan officer, eventually. She learned to speak English from listening to Vin Scully do Dodger games, which is actually a very common story. Have any of you heard that story before? When Vin Scully retired at age 88, the LA Times actually did a story, Kathleen might remember this, and it was they interviewed all these people who said they learned to speak English from listening to Vin Scully do Dodger games, and it was hundreds of people. Filipino, Mexican, Chinese, and my Swiss mom. So my mom, this, this is her over here, and that's my grandmother Rosa. My mom hated the idea of beauty, of makeup, and of cheerleading. I'm glad you trusted me. <laughs> So when I was 12, I was the oldest of five kids. We had foster kids at my house too. It was 10, 9, 8, 7, and 6. And that started when I was 5, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. So by the time I was 12, I wanted to be a cheerleader because my friends and I decided that was the only way to get boyfriends. So I'm going to read you this, this part. Um, what my mom said is, no, you can't be a cheerleader because they're all brainless and they're all going to get pregnant. And I was like, but we're 12. <laughs> so <laughs> she didn't like the idea. What would be the right word? I'd say frivolity. It seemed like being a cheerleader was frivolous. And I was going to be raised to be a secretary and to work hard. So um, I'm going to read you this little part. We had decided to be cheerleaders because that's the only way that we knew we could get boyfriends. My three friends and I, but especially my best friend Tammy, practiced the cheerleading routines walking up and down the street. We practiced and practiced and practiced, and unbeknownst to my mom, I made the team. But only because I was so small, so short, that they needed someone to put on top of the pyramid. I had bowed legs, a fang, a gap between my teeth, and back then I had blue cat eye glasses, which are worn with some you know, popularity now, which, which were not worn ironically back then. My legs resembled peeled mulberry branches. I was so small and thin. When I told my mother about the cheerleading, she was angry about the uniform. It cost money. We were supposed to go see Mrs. Smith, Yoshiko Smith, who measured us with nudges and tape. My entire neighborhood was made up of mothers from somewhere else. Mrs. Smith was from Kyoto, Japan, she had been married to an African-American serviceman from Texas, and she had four boys. Our next-door neighbors were Filipino and Japanese. My friend Ed Lachika said his mother and father argued over which kind of ghosts were inhabiting their house, Filipino ghosts or Japanese ghosts. <laughs> These fights were epic. Next door was Eddie Rose. His mother was from England. And at the top of our block, Richard Box, whose mother was German and whose father was black, was a basketball star in seventh grade. My mom said, I couldn't get a uniform, I couldn't be a cheerleader, but my sullenness persisted. So finally, she took us camping. You might not believe this, but we went to Yogi Bear Campground in Oak Glen, California. We were in a small travel trailer, me and my two brothers, and my dad was gone working. My stepdad, which I'll get to, he owned three laundromats in, in the Riverside area. On the third day, however, I revolted. The cheerleaders were going to have a trip to Disneyland and then cheerleading camp. I insisted that my mother take me. She was angry, but finally, in the morning, at dawn, when the fog rose up on Boo Boo Lane, which is the street we were camped on, <laughs> she put me in the back seat with my endless, of course, amount of library books, 
and my younger brother, who was eight, in the front seat to keep her company on the hour drive home. She started the car, and in the cold, the engine of the Ford 1966 Country Squire model, which, by the way, I looked up when I was writing this, weighs 4,700 pounds, and is the last model without an automatic braking system in case of emergency. It stalled. It stalled again. And the third time it stalled, and she pulled the emergency brake, she said that it stripped. Now we were going backwards down, the, down a steep boo-boo lane toward a ravine. My mother said that she yelled for us to jump, but I didn't pay attention. On her way out, she wrenched the wheel, and by the time I fell out, the car ran over me. Both legs broke my femur in half. There's a pause here. The femur is the largest bone in the body, I found out in the hospital where I was in traction for two months. The nurses were stern. Children didn't get pain-killing medication back then. I was in traction, which was quite primitive. There were two pieces of tape attached to the sides of my legs and weights off. And then you remember how you'd see cartoons where people would have their leg up in the air? My leg was up in the air. Of course I couldn't be a cheerleader because I couldn't walk. I'm going to stop there because the point of it all was that my leg was fixed perfectly. But when I got back to school, I couldn't walk, I couldn't be a cheerleader, but I'd had a lot of time to read. So I wanted to start with this great story of why my mom ran over me and made me into a writer, which is a good story. And if you think it's terrible that I tell the story, my mom heard me tell it once, and when people teased her about it, she said, well, if I wanted to kill her, wouldn't I have run over her head? <laughs> <laughs> so they're like, was it an accident? And I'm like, it seemed to me in the telling that it was an accident. I think it was an accident. By the time I got to eighth grade, I was a cheerleader. I was on the top of the pom-pom squad, only because I was so small, and I couldn't really do anything. But I met my future husband. That's the other part, because you're like, there are a lot of people who do not look like you. Beginning of ninth grade, uh, my high school, John W. North, was sent to Los Angeles on a field trip to the LA County Zoo. My high school, John W. North, which Patsy knows, whenever I meet someone, like the guy I met in the elevator at Santa Barbara City College, and he says, I'm from Riverside. We always say, really? What high school did you go to? He went to Rubido, and I said, oh, do you know the Butzes? One of the women I'm going to show you is the Butz, and he said, yeah, my aunt is Lisa Butz. Turned out we were cousins. Um, it, and we met in the elevator. It was pretty fun. Um, he was a short black man with long dreadlocks. I'm a short white woman with my hair, and we're cousins. Um, as it turned out, uh, my high school was kicked out of the LA County Zoo because we were too noisy. And they were, we were told to get back on the bus and go home. I sat in the second to last seat, and my future husband was in the very last seat. He's a very tall black man. He's 6'4". When we got married, he weighed 185 pounds. Now he weighs 310 pounds, and he's a correctional officer. The joining of our two families was pretty simple. This book actually begins with the one photo where you see a beautiful woman who looks like she's a member of the Supremes. There are two women in that photo, and that is what I ended up making for this frontispiece. This woman, Alberta, was my mother-in-law for many years. So when I try to explain why I wrote the book, like why write memoir, because it's much harder, and I'm looking forward to the question and answer part, because I love I love it if we can talk about what, what's the difference between writing fiction and, and writing memoir. I had all these stories in my head for 30 years, but what I like to say is, my life changed in 1976, the year of our bicentennial, when my mother-in-law, future, Alberta Sims, held out her hand to me in the driveway on Riverside's east side. I was wearing a halter dress from the swap meet. Don't even ask, because <laughs> we really were poor. I had borrowed platform shoes from a friend of mine, and they were so tragic that my future husband, we were 15, I was 15 and he was 16, he had a pen knife, which you could have back then in school. He would, between classes, tap down the little nails in the platform, because each time I walked, they would lift up and the sole of my shoe would flap. And, and, and they were borrowed. And he was so tender that he would, that was one of my favorite things to write in here, he would pound down the nails for me. So I went to his house for Labor Day, 
And, oops, sorry, I don't know what happened. I went to his house for Labor Day, and I went up the driveway, and there were 100 people. And that was the small family gathering. And Alberta, my mother-in-law, opened the door, held out her hand, and said, come inside and make you a plate. So the sentence I wanted to say to you is that sometimes we meet someone, and that is the life-changing moment, isn't it? And we don't even know. It could be a teacher. It could be your future spouse. It could be your best friend. It could be a stranger that says something to you one time, and you remember it. But what my mother-in-law did was invite me into the kitchen. I'm the first white person to hang out at the house. There are men in the driveway and women inside. The men are telling stories, and that was one of my favorite chapters to write. The men are telling stories and playing dominoes and eating and drinking beer. And the women are inside, and they're telling their own stories. I followed my mother-in-law into the kitchen. And this was a big spread of food. And I saw dishes. My mom is Swiss, and you've seen my step-grandmother. Swiss people are super good at cleaning. I was raised to, to wash dishes from the time I was four and had to stand on a stool. So I started washing the dishes, and my mother-in-law began to talk to me. And she was slicing huge pieces off of a, uh, a piece of meat. And she said, you know, you always have to cook for the stranger because you never know who's going to stop by and be hungry. And that went like directly into my head. Not that my mother wasn't generous. We had foster kids. But we only had enough food every night for us. In fact, my dad was always like, are you going to eat that pork chop? And we'd be like, yes. <laughs> and we'd like guard it as if we were in prison, because my dad would just stare at you. And if you thought you were going to get up and go get ketchup, you'd come back in your, because you only got one piece of meat, and I think you always wanted two. My mother-in-law had grown up in a way that she'll be the next story, where once she had meat, she would give food to anyone who stopped by on the street. So that's where I thought I'd actually pay attention and tell you the story of the three women, besides my grandma, who kind of made this book. So how many of you were born like within an hour of where you live now? Only a few people in this room, right? If we were in Riverside, it would be half and half. You'd have people who just arrived, right, from the Philippines, from Mexico, from Nigeria, from anywhere else in the United States. But you'd have a huge complement of people who still live in Riverside. How many of you were born more than an hour away from here, from Santa Barbara? And it's a majority here. In Riverside, all of these women that I'm going to tell you about thought that Fontana and San Bernardino and Riverside and Los Angeles really were the promised land, and so they never left. So my mother-in-law, Alberta, she's in that one picture. This is her mother, Daisy Carter. And this is her aunt, known as Sweet Annie, one of the most vicious women ever to grace the streets <laughs> of Riverside. And yet, she was a famous, beautiful dancing girl in Sunflower County, Mississippi. The other woman is Hattie Moss, who's now 95 and still lives in Riverside. Um, Daisy Carter is the beginning of the other of the two stories I'm going to tell you. And these are really sad, so you'll have to bear with me. If my mom had a tough time when her mom died, Daisy Carter was five years old and walking down a dusty road in Sunflower County, Mississippi, and her mother saw a speeding car headed this way on the dirt road and knew someone was coming to kill her. And the reason I tell you like that is because at the heart of this book is that women tell stories to each other. Do they not? I'm not trying to diminish any of the men in this room because Tom Boyle's here, he made me into a writer, sent me off to graduate school, did only good things for me, but women tell stories to each other that they will not tell men. Is that true? Yeah. Or they tell them differently to each other. So the story I just told you about my mom, no, she did not tell me that story until five years ago. But the stories that Alberta and her sister Rosie and her other sisters who are not in this tiny little fragment, which is this big, those were stories told to me at Alberta's house, in the kitchen, in the driveway, in the dark. After everyone's eaten and we put the dishes away, we would sit out there and under the eucalyptus trees or the shamal ash, which is what we have, women would tell me these astonishing stories. And Alberta told me that when she asked her mom, what happened to your mom? Daisy Carter said, the car was speeding toward us, and my mother threw me up onto the road bank 
and the car plowed into her and killed her, and the two young white men drove off, and we never saw them again. And Alberta said to me, my mom never had a home. She went from pillar to post, pillar to post, until she got to Riverside. So I'm 16, 17, 18, and I'm hearing this story, and I don't understand what pillar to post means, right? What does it mean? It took me years to understand, because I did not want to ask her what that meant. It wasn't until I had my first daughter, who's 30 now, and was sitting nursing her, because Alberta watched her when I was at work, and at lunchtime, I went to her house, we watched one soap opera, I nursed the baby, and then I went back to work. All the other women came to Alberta's house after that. Pillar to post. You went from a porch that had pillars to maybe a porch that had posts. You went from one house to another, one house to another. Daisy never had a home. Her father was gone, and she was sent to a farm. She had to quit school at age 10, and no one was ever prosecuted for killing her mom. Annie, the mean-looking one, sweet Annie, was her aunt. And when Daisy was 17, she said, you're beautiful. We're going to go on the road, and we're going to make you a star. They were dancing girls in the early 1920s in Mississippi, which was dangerous. So they went to Arkansas. And now comes the sad part of the story. You guys are like, wait, it's all sad. Daisy, who you saw wearing the hat, has an incandescent smile. You, you can see her beauty. She married someone very young. She was 18. And she had her first baby, and I'll show you when the next um, picture of the three girls comes by. And her husband said to her, and this was in Wewoka, Oklahoma, you're fine. You're so fine, as a matter of fact, that someone's going to steal you away from me, and I'm not going to let that happen. So I'm going to have to kill you before you leave. So he sat by her bedside every night with a pistol, staring at her. She had this brand new baby, and that was Mary Louise. And you'll see a picture that has three women sitting around a small table, and Mary Louise is the oldest daughter. She's in the back. So of course Daisy waited until he put the gun away, which took a long time, and then she and Annie, her aunt, ran. After that, they ran Arkansas, back to Oklahoma, then they went to San Antonio, Texas, and then they ended up in Las Cruces, New Mexico, and each time, and a lot of you know this because people talk about during the Depression, why did someone stop somewhere? Yes. Ran out of gas or the car broke down, right? And then they'd stay for six months. So the car broke down in San Antonio and they stayed for six months. Somewhere the car broke down in Las Cruces, New Mexico, and they stayed for six months because some of the cousins ended up staying in Las Cruces, New Mexico. And um, one of Daisy's cousins became the first black uh, provost at University of New Mexico. But Daisy ended up in Calexico, California with her Aunt Annie at the home of her Uncle Jonah, who had a hay farm. When she arrived in 1936, she had four daughters. She never told any of them who their fathers were. Because each time she got married, she married someone who threatened her or was a terrible man, and she'd have to pack up in the middle of the night and find her aunt. So it's a sad, terrible story, except for that. Once Daisy got to Riverside, it was World War II. She worked nights in a munitions factory in Mira Loma, California. And during the day, no, I'm sorry, it was the opposite. She worked days in the munitions factory, and Annie Tillman watched the girls. At night, they worked at a turkey plant, plucking turkeys. She saved so much money, and her girls saved so much money, that by the time I knew Daisy Carter, and I only knew her for one year before I married her grandson. Um, I knew her for one year before she died. She had bought a two-story white Victorian house on the corner of Kansas and 11th Street. There is a picture that's going to come through here where there's a shy young woman looking down, and there's another woman standing with her, and that is Alberta. And Alberta married my father-in-law, General, and that is General's mom, Callie, and his brother Stan. So the meaning of these two families, Sims and Morris, is the meaning of Oklahoma and Mississippi, and like all of American history, because Callie's father was mixed race. His father was a slave owner who owned him, and his mother was an enslaved woman. 
and Callie herself married a man that was part Cherokee and part black. So there's Daisy, Annie, and Hattie. And when Daisy's daughter married Callie's son, this whole family comes together. So it's a lot. And you guys are like, these are terrible stories. What I'm here to say is that I don't know how to describe the heroics of women, except for to say that we always hear the stories of men, don't we? So that's how I began this book. I began this book with this idea that I remember being in school and hearing about the pioneers. I remember hearing about the wagon trains. I remember hearing about fur trappers. I remember hearing about all the people who crossed this nation. And I rarely heard about women. True? And I always thought when I was a kid, because I was the oldest of five, you know how much laundry I did. Well, who did all the laundry? <laughs> it's true that there was a chuck wagon guy when I watched Wagon Train on TV. There was always, you know, the chuck wagon guy, but I'm like, I don't think he was everywhere. So this is Alberta, and this is her sister-in-law, uh, Loretta. Now, Loretta just died two years before this book came out. What I decided is that I would write the heroics of women. So I took my grandmother, who ends up in Fontana, right, Rosa Lou. She came the farthest, 11,000 miles minimum. That's not counting, really, like Switzerland. <laughs> but she came all that way to Fontana, and she became, within three weeks, head nurse at Kaiser Steel. How many people in this room have Kaiser HMO? Anybody? No? Because Kaiser is 12 million people strong. My grandmother was head nurse at Kaiser Steel back when Kaiser Steel was a full-on steel mill. And Doug McCullough, my friend, has this great Will Connell photo. Patsy, it's this great photo with sparks. It's them rolling steel in the steel mill. And my grandmother, when she saw that, she's like, oh, they brought the men to me and their arms would be cut off. And we'd be like, OK, Grandma. <laughs> And then she'd be like, would you like to carve the turkey? And we're like, no, we don't want turkey now. My grandmother retired from Kaiser Steel, but she had worked there when Kaiser Steel, the hospital, Kaiser Permanente, was a two-room stucco building. And she was fierce, and she was in charge until she retired to Hemet, which is why Patsy and I know Hemet together. My grandmother died at 96. And you see those color photos that come up? That's me talking to my grandmother in her mobile home in Hemet. When she died, she was the oldest living member in the nation of Kaiser Permanente. Her Kaiser number was like 600. So she broke her femur, which I thought was pretty funny. So did she. Because when I broke my femur, she's like, the femur is the biggest bone in the body. You will limp all your life and never find a husband. And I was like, OK, what's with you guys? I'm 12. <laughs> like, what's with the babies and the husband thing? But as it turned out, the doctor did a great job. So my grandmother dispassionately, when I got my body cast off after two months, said, the doctor did a good job. Perhaps you'll find a man. Um, yeah. When she died, though, what I remembered was that when she broke her femur and she went to Kaiser La Sierra, my grandmother still had this very strong German accent. And all the nurses were gathered in the room. I went to visit her late at night. And there were eight nurses in the room. And they said to me, your grandmother's OG. She's like the OG nurse, original gangster. And I was like, <laughs> you're right. And the nurses that were telling me this were from the Philippines, Mexico, and Jamaica. And they're like, your grandmother is telling us stories about what she used to do. And she keeps asking us why we're not wearing our caps, right? The starch nurse caps. I was trying to do, in this book, an honoring of all the female ancestors that in a family like mine that has four to 500 people cross continents and sort of made their own way bravely. Daisy Carter came by herself. Yes, she had her aunt, but her aunt also was a woman. They crossed the continent by themselves. Not only did they cross by themselves, this is what I ended up writing, that I remembered when I was studying the Greek myths, right? Odysseus um, always had new men on the ship. Remember? He'd go past the Scylla and the Charybdis, and like six men would get plucked off. And then magically, he'd have more soldiers. So what I ended up writing was, this is a letter to my three daughters. And you see them at the very end. Our women were not in history class or film or the literature of the canon. 
Our women survived the men who survived the cannons of war. We hung out with hard men, weak men, good men. We married them. We got babies. We got violence. We got guns, more babies, the laundry, the pots, dancing, pigs, chickens, bread. But we kept the nation alive. The women who came before you, my daughters, were legends. Their flights lasted decades, treks that covered America after they arrived here from the continents of Africa and Europe and married indigenous people of this continent. These women crossed countless rivers. They were, like Odysseus, imprisoned and seduced and threatened with death. If you remember the story in the Odyssey, you have the sirens, the lotus eaters, you have cyclops. Our cyclops were husbands. Sometimes we had to wait for the husbands to fall asleep in order to escape, and that was Daisy Carter. Sometimes our women battled other women who were sirens or who tried to steal their children because they always had their children on the boat and even other women's children for whom they had become responsible. Odysseus survived everything to return to his wife and son, but he did not have little kids on his boat. Though he kept losing his soldiers, he started out with a damn army. But instead, my daughters, your female ancestors had endless brigades of foolish and jealous men who tried to stop them. These women had murder and marrow on their minds, and they shed blood for us. And that's the last story I wanted to tell you, because I can't tell you all of the stories, but Tina knows where I'm headed. If you go back to the very beginning, the first picture that shows up is of an elderly woman, and it's a very creased photograph. It's the only, and all of these photos are, are in the book, thanks to Douglas McCullough. There, for most of these women, there's only one photo of them. Even for my grandmother, Rosa, there are maybe 10 pictures of my grandmother when we put them together for her funeral. The very first woman is fine. You can see how beat up this picture is. Thanks, Nick. It, this is the first woman that we sort of have a record of. And Fine's story is sort of the anchor, so I thought I'd end with it. If you look at her face, you know she's a grandmother, right? You can tell. She has that grandmotherly look. Fine, as well, was five years old when her mother died. So Fine's mother was enslaved in Murfreesboro, Tennessee. That's all I could find of her. The story that I heard, the first story I ever heard of Fine, Again, I was 16, 17 years old, and we're at a family reunion in Fairmont Park in Riverside. And we're underneath the eucalyptus trees, and there are big, long tables, and there are 400 people in my husband's family. 400 people are there. And an uncle, Uncle John, another uncle, Uncle Bobby, Uncle Stan, and my father-in-law, General. These huge men, first black lead engineer for the Los Angeles Department of Water and Power, Uncle Stan. First black sheriff's deputy in Los Angeles County, Uncle Bobby. One of the first black letter carriers in Los Angeles, Uncle John. And my father-in-law, General, he hated everybody. He was a Marine, and he just wanted to be a landscaper and not talk to anyone. He's the one that ended up in Riverside. All those four men came up to me, and they said, you know, we're here because of a, a little girl named Fine. They told me that when Fine's mother died, and she was five, she was the youngest of five kids, and it was only five years after slavery ended. All five kids were lined up in the doorway, and they were taken away by white families to different plantations because where they lived was so rural, it was as if the Civil War never ended. And if you're like, wait, where was her father? Fine's father was a free Cherokee man. Andrew Jackson, as uh, when we were in, at San Bernardino City College, the students all knew this. Andrew Jackson, Manifest Destiny, the Indian Removal Act, he was chased away by vigilantes and federal troops. So when Fine's mother died, the five children were lined up, and Fine was the youngest. She was five years old. She was taken away by a white family, and she chopped wood, hauled water, she wore rags, she had no shoes, and she wasn't allowed to eat. She could only eat scraps from their plates. She slept in the barn. She was so hungry, she told her grandkids, who would have been my father-in-law 
and the uncles I just mentioned. She was so hungry that she would go out in the woods and find bird's eggs and boil them. And she was so scared she'd be caught that she would eat them hot. And, and she told her grandkids, my mouth was always burned. Her main duty was chopping wood and hauling water. The elderly woman, the grandmother at this plantation, beat fine every day. And I don't know what she beat, beat her with, because the story that she was telling her grandkids is that I was beaten every day while I was chopping wood. And one day, when I was in the woods, looking for eggs, looking for berries, she found a bullet. And of course, it's after the Civil War. So the woods were full of bullets and bones. And that was a really hard part to write in here, the detritus of Civil War. I looked up what happened to people during Reconstruction in that exact area, and I included a little bit. If you were a freed black family during Reconstruction, so I'm talking about 1870, 1880, you were often just shot down on the road because you were not valuable. You were not owned anymore. So this is the world Fine lived in. She found this bullet, and she decided, she's nine years old now, that she was going to kill the old woman who beat her. I cannot imagine, at nine years old, forming that kind of conscious thought. So to write a book like this, it's not enough to just know. Here are all the stories. And I thought, especially for those of you who are writers, or who are working on memoirs, or who just are teaching or like to think about story, how do you tell a story like that? I heard it when I was 16 or 17, and I'm 50, I turned 59 yesterday. Yesterday was my birthday. That's how long it took me until I wrote this book to figure out how to tell a story that I was told again and again every year. Uncle John would tell me every year, Susan, you're the only one that can write this story. You're the writer in the family. I'm the only white person in the family, which is pretty funny because they forget that all the time. So they're like, this is you. You have to write this. I had no idea to write how to write about fine, or even about my own mom. So I went back to the bullet, and I pictured she had it in her apron pocket, and she's nine years old, right? So let me ask you this. Who's willing to say? What were you doing at nine, nine years old? Anyone? Roller skating. What? Roller skating. Roller skating. Anyone else? Do you, you guys are like, we don't remember nine. <laughs> no one else? Reading. Right. I was nine years old, and the bookmobile showed up. I was allowed, as the oldest of all these kids, two hours every Sunday, every other Sunday, I was allowed to walk to the bookmobile. It was the highlight of my life. I read Alfred Hitchcock and Agatha Christie, so I thought everybody died all the time. Um, that's what happened with my first fiction. Everyone just died all the time. <laughs> when Fine was nine, that day came where she was chopping wood, and that's where I ended up starting this whole thing. A bullet. All those bullets, balls of lead aimed at the heads of soldiers on both sides, and then at freedmen and freed women, the countryside near Murfreesboro littered with bullets, cannonballs, bones, maybe unburied bodies, decades of war and retribution, the hunting and killing of animals and humans. Fine put the bullet into the pocket of her apron. It was her talisman. She was, about ele not, she was from 9 to 11 years old, and in her mind, having not a single human to help her, because she never again saw any of her siblings or her father. She was capable of murder. She didn't know anything about gunpowder or firing pins. She only knew people died from bullets. Uncle John Sims told me Grandma was out picking berries. She was hauling wood with great care everywhere she went. She hid that bullet away for just the right moment. And one day, this is as he told me the story, the way she told him, I was chopping wood for the family stove, and the old woman came out to watch me. I told her, these wood chips are flying, and you're liable to get hit. But she told me to shut up and get to work. As Fine told her grandkids, soon the opportune moment came. And when the woman was looking away, Grandma took the bullet out of her apron pocket. With all of her might, she threw it at the woman's head. It landed flush on her temple. I remember because I thought flush was such an interesting word that Uncle John used. 
A blood-curdling scream from the old woman. Grandma said, I told you to watch out for wood chips. The bullet fell harmlessly to the ground. The one thing she thought would give her a taste of revenge was a bitter disappointment. After that, I started trying to write about who Fine was. I was obsessed with the idea that my mom was nine when her mom died. And my real dad was nine when his father sent him up into the Rockies to herd the cattle by himself with a Model A Ford, and he had to stand on the outside of the running board and steer it and try to lasso them. All the stories that people told me that when they were nine is what stayed in my head. Fine was nine when she found the bullet. She kept it for that long. Her daughter, who's the next person wearing the fur collar, Jenny, killed a man when she was 17 after she'd been raped. Jenny fled Tulsa, Oklahoma and bought a house at 21st and Central in South Central Los Angeles. And when Callie's husband died, my father-in-law was nine, general. And he told me when we were nine and my father died, we had to put our bodies into the plow outside Tulsa. He said, I'll never eat a sweet potato again and I'll never eat a squirrel again because we lived on sweet potatoes and squirrel. He said, after my father died, the mule died and Uncle Stan and Uncle Bobby and I plowed with our bodies. All those children, Callie's seven, six children, were sent to Jenny's house in Los Angeles so they could go to high school. Callie herself ended up moving to Riverside when the kids were grown. She became a domestic worker and she watched uh, the family, four kids of a woman who was a teacher in Riverside, an elementary school teacher. I see that woman all the time and um, she always tells me, Callie raised those kids with me together. So every story seemed like it was too much and how could I fit it all into a book? So the last thing I wanted to say about that was that craft thing. I found, how many of you were writing? Anybody in here working on books or writing? Yeah, or how to tell a story, even an essay or a memoir. I found that if you're going to write a big story like this, it helped me to think about my own kids, who are the last girls you see. And Dolphine worked here at Santa Barbara Museum of Art for three years. This was a huge um, difference in her life, is that she worked here after she graduated from USC, and Santa Barbara became her home. She was married here a year and a half ago in the Santa Barbara courthouse. I wrote the book because who knows how long any of us are here, and Uncle John was right. He's 86 now, and he's the last of Callie's children to be alive because Aunt Loretta just died, the youngest. Uncle John is the second youngest. He lives in Sacramento. He would call me every year and say, did you write fine story yet? Did you find time to do it? It's not that I didn't have the time, I was scared. Those kind of stories are much more difficult to write than fiction. Fiction is easy. You guys are like, no, it shouldn't be if it's good. <laughs> fiction is a joy, I'll say that, because it's my imagination. I can make anything happen that I want. This was much harder. My mom was a really hard woman because she lost her mom. Fine lost her mom. Daisy lost her mom. Everyone lost someone, and that's how they were shaped. So instead of doing what I thought I was going to do, you know, chronological order for each one, which would have been terrible, I ended up thinking this was the photo that started it. This was the second photo. It's a Polaroid. This is Aunt Myrtle, Aunt Mary, and Aunt Rosie. And Alberta took the picture. And isn't it beautiful as a Polaroid? It's the top hat bar in Riverside, which doesn't exist anymore. It's been raised. And all these women are gone. And so I went back to that first fragment of photo and I thought, the mystery of Alberta is that Daisy arrived with four daughters and they never knew where they were born and they never knew who their fathers were. And you know that phrase, she took it to the grave? She really did take it to the grave. So I thought, what is it about the secrets that women tell each other? And that those secrets are in the air, right? And they're not pulled down and written down, but they can be. That was the structure. I thought I should write this for my daughters so they realize really these journeys that all these women made. They only know their grandma as this very short, very stern woman, and yet here's this picture of her. It's the only picture where she is with her mom holding her hand, and it's a kindergarten parade in the, in the Alps of Switzerland. And so for my daughters, you saw their picture. They're Cherokee, Creek Indian, Irish, Swiss, French and African. 
no one knows what continent. Well, everyone says, why don't you just do DNA? Then you'd know. My girls decided against that. The funny thing was, when we talked about Santa Barbara, Delphine said, what difference does it make? We know all the people that we're from now. And so I wrote this book sort of to let them know, these are all the people that came before you. All of the blood of all of these different continents is in you. I am the most generic looking. You know? I am such an Ameri dull American. You know, I look absolutely ordinary. And yet when people see my kids, they're like, wow. And my kids know they're very Swiss. Rosette, the baby, the youngest one, super good at saving money. When Rosette was five, we used to borrow money from her. And she'd say, I only have a 50. I'm not going to break that for you, Delphine. And Delphine would be like, who are you? What, what is happening? Well, Rosette is the Swiss one. And she's still the best at saving money. Delphine is my artistic genius who learned so much here from Karen Sinsheimer. That's who she worked for. And Karen was the woman that changed her life. So as I was writing this book, Delphine said, if I had to choose the woman who changed my life and made me who I was, I mean, yeah, I know. She's supposed to pick me, and she did. It was Karen Sinsheimer here at Santa Barbara Museum of Art. This is the only place I can say that. I haven't been able to say it on my, this whole trip around the whole country to talk about the book. I was so looking forward to saying it here in this room that Karen was a pioneering curator. She was a woman who was so generous. She spent so much time showing Delphine how to navigate the world of museums that Delphine's now getting a PhD at Berkeley in art history. And what does she want to do? She wants to be Karen. And that's from here. Gayla, the oldest one, is probably the one that's most like my mom. She is always worried. And she's the one who looks the least like my mom. She's tall. She's elegant. She's also getting a PhD at University of Texas, Austin. The last person that's been missing from this entire talk, and you don't have this photo. That's Gayla. Delphine's in the middle. And that's Rosette. And they're at the um, Los Angeles County Arboretum. Um, the last person is Dwayne, my now ex-husband, whom I met on that school bus. And if you want to see the most iconic picture that Patsy and I were laughing about, which everyone reproduces, the New York Times reviewed this book. And the picture that they chose is Dwayne and me when we were 19 in Venice, California. And I'm on, we're both on skates, rented skates. You can find it. It's ridiculous. Anyway, I'm not putting it up here. This was, this was not the place. But Dwayne was sort of Dwayne's and my relationship is at the heart of this. How do you raise women, young women, in this world? How do you tell stories of the ancestors? So he, when he saw this book the first time, I had him open the very first copy because Alberta, this photo just always made me cry. She died at age 61 when I was pregnant with Rosette, that youngest kid. So if Rosette is the most like her grandmother that she never knew, and yet has the Swiss in her, the point of a book like this and the point of readers like us is who makes you? Is it your blood, or is it the person you meet later? What is it that you have in you? I think the only thing that we can really give each other is story, right? You give each other the narrative. Let me tell you the story of your grandmother. And that's something we don't often do, is it? So as I've traveled around the country talking about the book, it's been fascinating how many women come up to me afterwards, and they're crying. And they're like, I never asked my grandmother why she wouldn't eat this, or why she wouldn't do that. And I always say, my father-in-law said he will never eat another sweet potato in his life. He doesn't care how many marshmallows you put on it, or you put it in Thanksgiving, and you put, you can, he said you could put a pound of brown sugar on it. I will never eat it again because we had to go out in the fields and get a sweet potato and then go shoot a squirrel and that was dinner. So we're always like, yeah, we're okay not giving you the squirrel. <laughs> what we often forget, especially right now, because Kathleen and I are talking about this, the world's not about argument. It's not about divide. It's really about story, right? What's the narrative that can bring people together? What's the narrative that helps if your mom is angry about something, which my mom was always upset about something, I now look back and think, she didn't have this. She didn't have this from a mom. She didn't know about that. We, we didn't have cream rinse or shampoo in my house when I was growing up. We had just a bathtub. We didn't even have a shower. Um, because my mom didn't know what shampoo and cream rinse were, because how would she have found out? So I went and spent the night at someone's house. I was like, what is this Breck? 
this is so, wait, you put this on your head? That's great. And they're like, what do you wash your hair with? And we're like, soap, bar soap. And they're like, no wonder you look so bad. <laughs> I went home and I was like, we have to have this stuff called cream rinse. And my mom was like, what is that even? The point is, when I was 12, I was pretty upset that I'd always washed my hair with bar soap and I looked bad. Now I look back and think, who would have told her? How would she have found out, right? So what I took away from the five years it took me to write this was just all of these stories, all of these people. There are two photos I didn't talk about at all. One it looks like the Dust Bowl, right? There are people that look like they're getting in an old car. That was my, um, my biological father's mother, and she was killed by my grandfather long before I was born, and her story is in here too. That was in the Rocky Mountains. So I figure there were all these stories, and what I'll end with is that when people used to say, the famous phrase was, go west. Yeah. I'm sorry. <laughs> but the women went west too, and they all ended up here in California. And all those women that I told you stories of, except for Fine. Fine is buried in Tulsa, next to General, my, my father-in-law's father, who died when he was only 30. But all of the other women, in all of the, the stories, they're all laid to rest in California, because to them, this was the promised land. And who were we to argue? This is where they thought that they could raise their families and make a stand. So, thanks for listening. Oh, and I'm happy to answer questions too, but that's the end of me. <laughs> I really do like the question and answer part, um, because especially for people who are writing. And um, yes? Hi. Uh, thank you for sharing uh, your story. It's, it's really powerful. Mine is less powerful because it's just about getting run over. It's not very brave at all. <laughs> I really appreciate what you had to say. I guess to answer the question you started with, I am from Washington, D.C. Uh -huh. um, and I like you talked about Eugene Walti. Um, there's a quote. Um, I think from her that says, write about what you don't know about what you know. I like that quote. Write about what you don't know about what you know. Right. And I, I feel like you, you certainly did some of that, and, uh, or you did that. That's what this book seems to be about, mm -hmm. a lot of it. And uh, Toni Morrison, who of course just passed, she said something like, the past is infinite. And right. It's full of stories, all these stories that you're talking about. And so my, I'm curious, do you have, have you written this, this book and it just seems like there are even more stories. Do you have any more stories? <laughs> the funny that? thing is, the two writers that are most in the book are Toni Morrison and Betty Smith. Um, I really enjoyed talking about this to the, the emerging teens class and to the um, class at San, Sa Santa Barbara City College. Toni Morrison's Sula was a book that I found when I was 12 years old at the library, the Riverside Public Library. I still have the copy. It was for sale. It was a used paperback. And um, I've written about it many times. Sula is a very slim book. It's not Beloved, which is the most famous book. But Sula is about two girls who were best friends from the time that they were very young and watching how women acted around them. So for example, there's a time when Sula and Nell, these two young black girls, are walking home from school. And they're always menaced by these three older white boys. And one day, as the boys come toward them, and it's told in very lyrical language, but this is what I read when I was 12. Sula bent down, put her slate carefully on the dirt, and she'd brought a knife with her, and she cut off the tip of her finger, a very small scrap. And she looked up at them and said, if I can do this to myself, what do you think I'm going to do to you? And the prose is like this. Nell, her best friend, is appalled, right? But she senses the boys melting away. I, this book was so powerful to me that I remember there are lots of stories I left out of this. In fact, I will say to you that when my children, when my three grown daughters, when I sent them the manuscript and gave it you know, to other people too, but I sent it to them first, and they were upset with me, not because of them. They said, why didn't you ever tell us all these bad things happened to you? And I said, because that's not what we tell our children. We tell our friends. We tell the women our age. We don't tell our children. And that's exactly what the whole thing about the book, like, of course my mom didn't tell me these things about the pig farmer. But that moment in Sula, 
I took that to heart so deeply that when someone menaced me and a friend later, I didn't cut the tip of my finger off, but I thought about how to be fierce enough, and I said, we're in your car, you've grabbed us, there's nothing we can do, these are two older men, we're 14, we've been driven way out to the country, we got kidnapped off a street corner, and I said, well, I guess I'm, I'm my, when, my, when I don't get home by five, my dad's going to be upset. I mean, he's at the sheriff's office. I mean, he always has two guns in his car. I don't, I don't even know what to think. And they were just like, no. And they just took us right back to the corner, shoved us out. And Tammy's like, your dad has a laundromat. And I'm like, shut up. What is wrong with you? She was the one that, you know, was going to be scared. I thought I got that from Sula. And the other book, A Tree Grows in Brooklyn, does anybody remember that book? Yeah. Right. So... When I used to walk to I walked to school when I was four. Like I was just I had this late birthday, and my mom was like, "School, it's free. You're going. Walk that way, that way, and that way." So I walked. But when I was like seven, there was a flasher, and I like telling this story because it's ridiculously California. Here we are. We're like seven years old. We have to walk down this dirt pet trail to get to school, and here's a guy with an overcoat. It's like 109, right? It's September in Riverside. We're like, hmm, a coat. <laughs> The thing was, the minute he flashed us, all I could think was, Francie's mom in A Tree Grows in Brooklyn, when there's the pervert, as he's called, and he's coming toward Francie, her mom comes down with a gun in her apron pocket and shoots him where it counts. I am such a weirdo in terms of books, and I was like, where's Francie's mom? <laughs> Why can't she walk to school with us? And my friends have already run, and I look around like, oh, everyone else is gone already. I'm still thinking of A Tree Grows in Brooklyn. As a word obsessive and nerd, there, were, um, there are a lot more stories, and there are scarier stories than I told you. And they didn't belong in the book because they were someone's secret. Or they didn't belong in the book because that person is dead, and I do not have the right to tell that story. I can tell Fine's story about the bullet, and Jenny's story about killing someone, because she told those stories directly to the people who told them to me. And so I say, I was told this story, I would not tell a story that explicitly someone told me. There are stories about Aunt Loretta, and they are not in the book. So there were so many other stories. It's very difficult. But yes, I love, I love the quotes that you brought up. So the writing about what you don't know about what you know is, a, is very good advice. I never say to my students, you can only write what you know. Right, Tom, that would be a crazy thing to say, right? And I always also tell my students, if you're going to write about being like a heroin addict, I don't want you to go do that. That's insane. Like, you're going to have to use your imagination. So the other part, even in a, a memoir, which is supposed to be true, of course the moment you start to write it, you've changed it, haven't you? You've altered it yourself, and it's not the same story that was told to you. So for nonfiction, I think we have to remember that too. You can't you can't tell it exactly the way it happened because you weren't there. You're recounting it, and it's almost like that game of telephone, isn't it? Which, it, it means it's even more important that we do it carefully. Good question. Does anybody else have questions? Uh-huh. Um, thank you so much for these wonderful stories. I agree with you 100% about the connections between women and the stories that we tell each other. Um, not just in person, but in text from generation to generation. Right. So that uh, Jane Austen is telling me a story. Right. And I'm telling it, she's telling it to my students, and I'm telling it to my students. And it's remarkable how little has changed since Jane Austen in That's some ways. Correct. Right. right. It's but just people, I, people have Tinder now. That's all. Right. <laughs> like, as I was listening to you, I was thinking about the fact that I have three sons. Mm -hmm. I have no daughter. And I, I, I am now thinking hard and will continue to think hard about, um, you know, how the difference in right. our genders, my sons and myself, how that affects the storytelling that you're, you know, on which you focus today. Yeah. Um, I, and so I'm wondering if you have any thoughts about that, about... Um, you know, men who tell stories to their daughters, women who tell stories to their sons, well, et cetera. I think it's a great thing to bring up. No one's brought it up at any of the previous things I've been doing for two months. And I think it's because we have this really weird thing, like I said, where everything has to be a divide now. 
where people are like, I can't trust men, I can't trust women, I can't trust this person on a political party, I can't trust this person who's a different race. It's, it's a strange thing because, on the other hand, I'm constantly saying, this giant man that, I, that comes to my house still three times a week, even though we're divorced, we know each other's stories. What my kids say is it doesn't matter who you guys ever meet. You have all these stories that only you know. We almost speak in a secret code. We can talk to each other and our kids won't understand a word we're saying. Because he'll be like, yo man, CB had to get tennis shoes for that, you know, 6'4". And he had to go to CB to do it. And I'll be like, oh, well that, that was early in the morning. And the girls are like, what did dad just say? <laughs> and I'm like, oh, Uncle Carnell, who's known as Chicken Butt, um, <laughs> CB had to get tennis shoes, which is a kind of tire that's like a really narrow tire for his 6'4", which would be an Impala. And to do that, he had to go to Casablanca because there's a guy there that restores Impalas. And they're like, oh my god. Must you? Must you too? And we're like, what? That isn't even, that's nothing. That's just also, he's a really, he's a very good storyteller. And he's in touch with his feminine side, I have to say. The funny thing about all of it is, you're right. It's not a matter of your, your sex as tar being a storyteller. I think it's a matter of loving narrative or, in the case of my mom, being so traumatized that you will never tell anyone anything. Because my mom, as well as my biological dad, never told anyone anything. And I was a freshman at USC, and we had a history class, and our assignment was, like, you know, roots had just happened. Our assignment was to, like, do a paper like roots. So I went to my biological dad's house, and I asked him questions. He literally said, it's none of your damn business. Don't ever bring it up again. And I was like, okay. So I made up a story, um, and I got a C, my first C ever. And I was really mad. So I was like, other people, their parents tell them the story. They got an A. That's what I cared about. He didn't want to tell me the story of his mother and her murder. Why would he tell me that? I had to hear that much, much later from her nieces and nephews, and they were in their 80s when they told me. And they told me, there's a whole chapter in this book, I'm on the Colorado Prairie, in a town, a ghost town of 300 people, and I'm related to half of them, and they're all gathered in this tiny little house, and they're staring at me, and they're like, it was your grandfather. And I, I did not meet the man and the fear in their voices, and they said, he had a gun, this is what he did. It was terrible, and yet, I felt so bad for my dad. Of course he wouldn't tell me that. So I think it's, it's very complicated, isn't it? To say to you, oh, I only care about the women's stories, isn't true. I'm, I've been trying for just as long to write the stories of the men. It's just really hard, and I'm not, my brother died too, very young, he was 38, and so I'm trying to figure out how to do the men's stories. So I have in, in the country of women, and then for the men, guess what, in the valley of the shadow of the men. And I'm like, that's not, <laughs> this is not a good title. That's not gonna happen. So I, I have to think about that. Sh did you have a question too? Yeah, uh, you're writing about uh, intimate secrets with your family. Have you gotten pushback from your mom or from relatives? My mom's not gonna read this book. My mom hasn't read any of my books. My stepdad read Higher Myra Moon, and I remember this. In fact, I talked about this, Patsy, the very first time I came here. It was 2001, back when we had answering machines, and I remember I came home from work and there was an, a, a message, and I pushed it, and my mom said, well, Richard must be proud. That means, like, my agent should be proud that I had a book out. So I was like, okay. Then she said, here's dad. They live a mile away. Here's dad. So my dad gets on and he says, well, you're no Tom Clancy but I finished your book. See you later. And he hangs up. And that's like my stepdad, who's the nicest man in my life. But like, you know, my mom's not going to read this book. Um, we've asked her about it. She said, in the country of women, I bet men aren't going to buy that book. And I'm like, maybe, maybe not. She said, that's a shame. That was the end. Like, that's what she said to me so far. Um, my kids have said, they, they were mad at me for not telling them how many bad things happened to me in high school and in college. And then I was like, what I just said. Um, everyone else is really happy. Uh, Alberta, well, Alberta died at 61. Her sister Mary died at 59, and her sister Myrtle died at 57. Daisy was 76 when she died. But Aunt Rosie, who was this beautiful person right here, she died two weeks after my book came out. And so, 
she lived, she was 85 and she had moved to Las Vegas. She was married to the owner of Circus Circus. She ran the wedding chapel at Circus Circus for many, many years. She was still that beautiful at 85 when she died. And the reason I tell you is because everyone's so happy about the book because all the pictures are in there that for the funeral, we all cooked. We each cooked for 100 people, like all of us, my sisters-in-law and me. There are 10 of us that do all the cooking. And um, then they asked me to stand up at the pulpit at the church and show this picture and the other picture and the picture of Daisy Carter. So I blew them up and they said, now Aunt Rosie is forever. You know, like everyone is forever. So that everyone's just been really happy. Yeah, which is good. All right, yes and yes. Um, in the process of learning about all these incredible women, were you inspired to take any of their fragmented stories and turn this in the future into fiction? And would you have an ethical dilemma about that? That is a very good question. Because I, I published eight novels for adults and one um, picture book for kids and then one middle grade reader. And so two of my novels, my, my novel Blacker Than a Thousand Midnights is about fire. It's about wildfires, which is fascinating. It came out in um, 1994. And it's based on my brother-in-law, Derek, who's 6'6", weighs 380 pounds, and is a, he's a cement uh, foreman. But when we were young, when we're exactly the same age, um, when we were young, he was a firefighter. And he worked for California De Department of Forestry up in Idlewild. And every Friday, they lived up there. And they, you know, they lived in the fire camp. He was the only black firefighter, and he was super tall. He was obsessed with fire. And he would come back on Fridays, and we'd be in the driveway. wherever There'd be like 100 people in the driveway. I mean, the TV's out there. It's like the Lakers, you know. It's every, and Derek would come to me, because everyone else was drunk and didn't want to hear his dumb stories about fire. And he would tell me about the rattlesnakes, deer, coyotes, rabbits, squirrels, everyone ran toward him away from the fire and he had his Pulaski which is a hoe and a pick put together and they had to chop the heads off the rattlesnakes and then everyone else would like run past, like these are amazing stories that nobody was listening to him, I was listening, after a while they're like don't get drunk and sit by her because <laughs> she listens to everything but Derek's like I wrote this entire novel and Derek knew it was based on him and it wasn't about him, because he wasn't married. It was about a young black firefighter who's obsessed with fire. It's such a California book, right? And many of us who grew up in places like this, today is the day, right, Patsy? The wind blows, and you're like, it's going to be a fire. And you're like a little kid, and you're just waiting, because you know where it's going to be, and you're going to ride your bike and go see it. That's how it used to be for us. So I have written fiction like that. I also wrote a novel. Um, I've been in Sarah's kitchen and licked out all the pots, which is a crazy title. But that was like an Oprah pick and a bestseller, and that was in 1992. And actually, I have come here to talk about that book at Calm for Sharon Bifano, who I see in the audience. You're like, you didn't recognize me. It just was awkward. I have come to the Calm Luncheon twice. Maybe three times. Anyway. And I talked about I've been in Sarah's kitchen because that's based on a woman that used to live in Daisy Carter's house who was six feet tall and had come from South Carolina. So fiction is, I've written a lot of fiction. I've never taken a story like Daisy Carter's story and made that into fiction, no. Like I, wouldn't, I would not have done that. I've never written about my dad. Um, I've never written about my mom like that. But I've written lots of fiction has. So the Tulsa Riots, one of my novels had the Tulsa Riots. And then High Water Moon is the other novel that has sold the most. And that is a woman who's deported to Mexico. And her daughter is raised in foster care. Of course I wrote about growing up with foster brothers and sisters and what it felt like um, for them to not have had a home. And, and I, I have known foster kids my entire life. I still work. With UCR, I'm on the board for Guardian Scholars. We have 35 former foster kids at UCR. And when they meet me, I'm like, I grew up with foster kids. And we're just like, so yeah, I donate lots of $5,000 a year I raise um, for that group. So that part of fiction, yeah, it's different. I had a question from her and a question from you. That's fine. Yeah, yeah you did have your hand up. Sorry. Thank you so much for your time and sharing your stories. I have a question more about your writing process. OK. Technical how you went through writing a book. So I wanted to know, through the five-year process of completing this 
know how long did it take you to write the first draft, and how long did it take you to edit? The question is to write this memoir, and novels and memoirs are they're similar and yet different. So to write this memoir took a long time, five years, but my last two novels each took five years as well. And it's funny, when my kids were little, I had three, three daughters, right? But you know, like they went to bed at eight o'clock, eight or nine, like they did their home. And then high school years, they'd be calling me at two o'clock in the morning. I don't wanna stay at prom. My feet hurt, can you come get me at so-and-so's house? So like everything slowed down. To take, a, to take five years to write a novel and maybe do two drafts is one thing. This book, though, I had to do so much research on Ancestry.com to augment like all the family stories. So in fact, I'm really glad you asked the question because as I was finishing the first draft, I was really nervous because it's real. And all these women who have passed away, I just felt like, man, I better do a good job, right? Like I just really felt like I owed them that. And fine was the big mystery because she was orphaned at five. And no one even knew her real name. You know what she was called? Fine, like this one's fine to work. That wasn't her name. They didn't know her name. And all I knew is that I found one document five years ago, and it said Catherine, C-A-T-H-E-R-A-N, slave, Henry Ely, E-A-L-Y, Murfins Burr, Tennessee. And I'm like, Murfins Burr? Like, what is that even? It was Murfreesboro. So the census guys would come around, you know, and they wouldn't really listen, and they would just write stuff down. So I got obsessed with fine. It took me three months, girl. I'm like, just focus on fine. Every night I'm up till two in the morning, and I'm like, Henry Ely, Catherine Ely, Murfreesboro, Nashville, fine Ely. So fine, le she, she had Aunt Jenny, the one with the fur collar, when she was 13. She met a boy while she was picking blackberries to earn, she to earn money for shoes. She had three kids in three years. She was maybe close to 14, 15, and 16. And then he disappeared. And so people are like, oh my God, what a terrible man. When someone disappeared back then, you don't even know why they disappeared. Like, they could be dead, right? She went to Denton, Texas, searching for Henry Ely, her father. She met this older man whose father was a slave owner. He was mixed race. He killed her middle son. He beat him to death. And he attacked Jenny, and Jenny ran away. Then they had two more kids, which is Callie. Callie's her half, Jenny's half-sister. Just to find that, do you know how many different names Fine had? She was Fine, Viney, Tinny, Finny, Fanny, Vinny. She had all different last names. Census records were terrible. But you know what's super helpful? City directories. If you look in a city directory, it'll tell you where someone's living, their address, whether they live in a rear house, you have the exact year, and voting records were good too. Super fun to watch how people change from Democrat to Republican back and forth, <laughs> like every two years or whatever. So I tell you this because that was my big concern, is I did finish a draft, and I felt like I didn't know the truth. So one night, it's one o'clock in the morning, I finally am like, I don't know what to do about this. And I think, wait, Aunt Sister, as we knew her, was General's oldest, Callie's oldest kid was a girl. Her name was Minerva Catherine, spelled with a K. And I was like, wait a minute. So I typed in Ely, E-L-Y, without the A, and Catherine with a K, and I found it. McMinnville, Tennessee, which is a very white, tiny, very dangerous, violent place even now. Birthplace of the Ku Klux Klan. There is Henry Ely, Catherine Ely, and five children. And the youngest is one year old in 1870, and her name is Safina. S-A-P-H-I-N-A. And her brothers are named Mac and James and Ely. Eli. And that's, no, Floyd, Mac, and James. And that's what she named her sons. And do I know that's her? I'm pretty sure. That's the closest I can come. And I just got chills. So then, after that night, then I was, okay, still another, so three drafts, but mostly a lot of that, and then a lot of cutting. You can't tell all the stories, because it's for you. Yes, it's for my daughters, but it's for, it's, you know, it's for you to read. So you don't want it to be 500 pages and have there be so many people. So three drafts over five years, and the, the chapter nine was my favorite. I ended up doing a whole chapter about when I was nine, 
And then when my children were nine, and then all of these people, what happened to them when they were nine? And that was my favorite chapter. Um, because think about it. When, when my mom was nine, this happened. When I was nine, this happened. When Delphine was nine, we took her to France. And somebody was making a film project, and they wanted us in it. And she was obsessed with cicadas. And she ended up writing about those cicadas, Patsy, for what was the, what was the show that has the bear, the Russian photographer? My Yep, she wrote about those cicadas when she was nine years old for SBMA. And so that was like full circle to me and it made me very happy. So I like that chapter the best, even though it's the weirdest. So, um, last question? You answered it. Yes. <laughs> what was it? How many drafts? It was how do you handle the telephone aspect of family stories when you're trying to find oh. the truth? And yeah. In a roundabout way. Well, I will tell you that there. I, I still was nervous. I, sp I stayed up many a night, and I came up with, you know how you have that thing where people write about fiction and they say, like, the, there's no resemblance intended, whatever? This is what I wrote. Memory is a sixth sense or a seventh, and so belongs in specific truth to the people who told me these stories over the span of 50 years. Because I just turned 59. Actually, the first stories were told to me by Alberta when I was 15, right? I've written them here as they were given to us, people whose lives were not documented by history, but by their own persistence in retelling all of us again and again how we came to be. That's the very last thing I wrote for the book because I was so nervous. So like the whole thing was done, and then I sent this off to my editor and I said, I think you have to put this in the front because it's not the whole, I told this to the best of my recollection or any of that. It's that all these women never thought anybody would write them down, did they? And yet they still told us over and over again. And I figured that's how stories were, especially when you grow up poor, you know, that no one thinks that their story is important. So I wrote it that way. So good way to end. Thank you guys for coming. <laughs>